It's a crossover, baby. Oklahoma Sooners, Ole Miss Rebels. Can the Sooners get the upset? Let's talk about it. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back in Thunderdome with Jay Smith, the host of the, or the co-host of Locked On Sooners with John Williams, who could not join us today. You know, Jay, I just need to know, honestly, I, I was telling people on my show all week, I genuinely like Oklahoma. I have no animosity towards Oklahoma whatsoever. So what, you know, ease my mind, what happened to Oklahoma this year? Everything did not line up the way that we hoped. When you lose five wide receivers and you go through like an assembly line of turnover on your offensive line from injuries because you get both of your offensive tackles drafted in the uh, one in the first round, one in the seventh. You have a few of them transfer that probably should have transferred two years ago, but you were being nice. You didn't pull a coach prime and kick everybody out. You just you decide to give everybody a chance and then you have to refresh that with a bunch of young players. So young offensive line, five wide receivers go down, and then you start your true freshman, well, true sophomore quarterback. Everything bad just lined up all at once on one side of the ball. Defensively, we're not bad. It's just the defense can't be as good as it can be because the offense keeps putting it in the worst situations possible. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting things that people can take away from this ball game. Now, Oklahoma's offense this year, if you look at most major stats that involve the offensive line, they are south of 100. Yep. Uh, even sacks and all of that stuff. And with Ole Miss being at the very top of that list and second in the country on defense, you have to figure that if Ole Miss scores 24 points in this game, it's it's night-night. So you mm, have to... 24 is too much. 17. 17? Uh, because... If you think about that, it, Brent Venables would probably want to have a game plan similar to what Kentucky did against Ole Miss and try to keep the ball for 40, 45 minutes of the game and hold on and wait for Ole Miss's offense to get greedy and make a mistake, and you can kind of take advantage of that. But this is what I noticed against South Carolina, and I don't know if Oklahoma fans noticed it or not, but Seth Luttrell was out there trying to run tempo. With the offense exactly like that. He was trying to do this tempo stuff. And if you do that against Ole Miss, they're going to score 50 in that game. They, they yeah. just are. I don't care how good your defense is. Joe John Finley is from the Jeff Levy tree. He's followed Jeff Levy all over his career. I figure that Oklahoma is at least going to try to do some of the stuff that Jeff Levy would have done at Oklahoma. You're going to see hitches. You're going to see bubbles. You're going to see screens. You're going to do what you can to protect that offensive line, but he's also probably going to run tempo. I think that this game, Jay, honestly, is a culture game. This is about winning the next game more than it is winning this game. Yeah, it kind of feels that way, too. For Oklahoma, the big thing is you when you replace your offensive coordinator, sometimes you, you kind of wonder what the locker room feels from that. Is it a sigh of relief? Is it, if it, do they feel hurt that they got their coach fired? What kind of the, the pulse is from that room? And honestly, that's what we're going to find out. Now, traditionally, when a team makes a big change from staff, they usually come out and play a lot different than they did the weeks before because that's usually sparks a new energy. That's now what we're trying to anticipate and see what how this team responds to a new play caller. And you're it's fair to assess that. Joe John Finley followed Jeff Levy. He was there with Lane Kiffin. And so, you know, tempo is something that could potentially be in there. Or they get smart and do what they can to protect this offensive line and, you know, take their time find ways to get the ball out of the quarterback's hands quickly and just pace themselves. We'll see if that's actually the game plan. Yeah, it should be really interesting what is going on there. I, like I said, Joe John Finley and Jeff Lebby, that connection, I've kind of been hung up on that all week. Mm -hmm. I just genuinely think the offense for Oklahoma, even though they're going to call it the same way, Seth Luttrell was much more air-raidy than it was that system. And I think that 
he's going to get back to a little bit of what they know. And you're going to see Oklahoma try to run the ball physical. They might not be successful because it's hard to run the ball on the almost defense. It is. But I do think that culturally they're going to try and get in there. They're going to ru- try and run the ball. They're going to do the screens and stuff like that. Because I just think that's what makes him comfortable. And honestly, that plays into Ole Miss's hands, but it might be the best situation for Oklahoma down the road if they want to win six, seven, eight ball games. No, I totally agree. It the 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 Sooners have the physical players to do it. We have the size. I mean, offensive line wise, we were averaging like three hundred and fifteen pounds. So we have big bodies. It's now all about going out there and physically pushing people around and making it happen. And for me, I just need to see them do as much as possible to get away from Walter Nolan. I consider him the best player in the country, um, even at the defensive line. Dude is legit. And we know that he's going to get drafted this year. Thank goodness. I'm, I'm sorry for you guys. But thank goodness for us that we won't see him in Norman next year. But overall, your defensive line is really, really good. I mean, the defense itself is good. The bigger thing for us is not only when it comes to protecting Jackson Arnold or if Michael Hawkins comes back in, the biggest thing is protecting the ball. I need them to not turn the ball over, which has been a problem the last few games. Well, actually this season on offense, you know, defense will go out there. They'll cause turnovers. We had one of the higher turnover margins up until like the last two weeks where we started giving the ball right back. So if we're going to be see any type of success, keeping the ball is going to be most critical and then taking it away. That's the one thing our defense is really good at taking the ball away. We're going to have to lean in on that very heavy. You know, if you look at the South Carolina score and everybody sees that 35 to nine and they're like, wow, South Carolina really handed it. Well, if you take away that disaster six minutes that Michael Hawkins had at the beginning of the game, it was 14 to nine. It was a good low scoring football game. And I think that Ole Miss fans need to keep that in mind. It was a true freshman having a true freshman game is Mm -hmm. the reason that game happened. And I told our fans the same thing. I said, look, when Michael Hawkins goes in here, you're going to have to give him some grace. You're going to understand there's going to be a lot of true freshman moments. And then you may see some senior moments where he just steps up and does something big. He had a lot of true freshman moments there. And Jackson Arnold had that against Tennessee. We force a fumble. What happens? He gives it right back. We force a fumble. What happens? He gives it right back. Luckily, that game only finished at 25 to, uh, what, 9 or 10 or whatever that score was. I can't even remember at this point. But... The South Carolina game, that was done within the first three minutes of the game. You know, it's 21 0. It's just awful. That, that entire six minutes was just so painful. And now that Seth Luttrell is no longer with the team and calling plays, I'm hoping that we do things to scheme the offensive line a little bit of extra time while also giving the quarterback the opportunity to get rid of the ball as quick as possible. I think there's opportunity there, but that's going to be the only way that we're going to see success and not get destroyed because. Ole Miss, your defensive line is pretty good. Thanks for tuning in to the Locked On Ole Miss podcast and the Locked On Sooners podcast. We're sitting here talking about the game this Saturday. Lots of stuff to get into, including players to watch and things like that whenever we come back. Stick around. Prize Picks is the most fun I've had playing daily fantasy sport this football season. And the best way to get into action is – With prize picks, and the best part, they're available in 30 states, including California, Florida, Georgia, and Oklahoma. So you can get in there now, sign up today, and get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even have to win. Uh, win uh, Win your match, you'll get the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. So, like, I'm looking at it today. You've got Ashton Genty. Do you think he can get more than 193 and a half rushing yards or less? What about Garrett Nussmeyer, 284 and a half passing yards, more or less. You can pick those. That's what I did. So go ahead, download the app today and use code LOCKED on college to get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup. Prize picks, daily fantasy sports, made easy. Let's talk about Home Field Apparel, the premium collegiate apparel company based in Indianapolis. They are hooking up all of the collegiate fans out there with some awesome gear for your favorite team. As you can see, I'm rocking my Oklahoma hoodie as we're getting closer and closer into true football weather. Now, because of that, Home Field Apparel has some cool boxes out there. They got football boxes that includes a 
three never before seen items. They've got bomber jackets. They've got coaches jackets, all of that. And in those boxes with those items that's never been before seen, they're curated to survive the entire season all season long. And if you get one of their platinum boxes, you'll get a new hat on top of the three never before seen uh, apparel. And you'll also get a platinum VIP card, which allows for you to get 20% off and early access. That way you don't miss out on any of the sold out items for your school's release throughout the entire 2024 season. Go check out Homefield Apparel. Go to homefieldapparel.com. Use our code SOONER24 to get a discount on your first order. Again, check out Homefield Apparel. Our code is SOONER24 to get 15% off your first purchase. All right, we're back in Thunderdome. Jay Smith from Locked On Sooners here. I'm Stephen Willis from Locked On Ole Miss. And let's get into some players to watch in this game. And I've seen some rumors, and there's a ton of rumors right now floating around. I mean, your mash list is – I think I made a joke of on a show a couple weeks ago. It was like a casualty list from the Battle of Antietam with as many players that are hurt. Um, It's crazy. And I saw that Gavin Sawchuck might be the next victim. Is, is what what is the story with him? Yeah, Brent Venables mentioned on his most recent press conference that Gavin Salchuk was going to be available to play against South Carolina, then squain, uh, strained his squad before the game. So it appears that there's a possibility he's going to end up on this availability report. And you're recording this right before it, but you'll see the first availability report. It'll be posted all over the interwebs, and there's a chance he'll be on there. Hopefully, we'll see Deion Burks down from questionable to probable. He was uh, dressed out to play in the South Carolina game, and he was moving around. It looked like he was doing good, but he's been dealing with a deep thigh bruise, I guess you could say. Something says soft tissue injury, and to me, that sounds like a deep thigh bruise if he's been gone this long. And that's one of those injuries where you don't really see it, but you feel it. And uh, I have a buddy, and I talked about this on my channel, on my, my channel, Unfair Sports, and I have a friend of mine whose son plays rugby, and he had a deep thigh bruise. And for him, he could run north and south, no problem. But the minute he planted his foot, he collapsed. So he's like, I can play the game. I just can't cut. I just have to run north and south. And hopefully it doesn't hurt when I'm going. So with the shiftiness of a Deion Burks, he needs to have the explosion on his cuts as well as his north and south. So hopefully he is getting better and he's down to probable. If he's probable, I sense he'll end up playing this game, which will be a huge lift for the Sooners going up against Ole Miss. It will. And and Trey Amos, who is a very good cornerback on Ole Miss' very. team, Deion Burks and Trey Amos, that would probably be a nice little matchup. Who's the second wide receiver on Oklahoma's roster that they need to pay attention to? Well, lucky for Ole Miss, the other four top wide receivers are not going to play in this game. Um, As Andrew Anthony had knee surgery again, had to clean up some scar tissue. It sounds like he's one of those kids that scars when you have surgery. So towards ACL against Texas last year, came back a little earlier, but it seemed like he was scarring up, so he had to have another procedure to clean things up. He won't play. Nick Anderson is still a few weeks out. Jaleel Farouk still a few weeks out. Jane Gibson's done for the year since fall camp. He'll be back next fall. So the next one really in line to look out for is J.J. Hester. He's been one of the more consistent wide receivers, and I say that as in he's had some drop problems, but at the same time, he's also caught some big plays. 6'4", 200-pound wide receiver. He runs a 4'4", whenever the ball is thrown to him deep. You got him, and then you got Brendan Thompson, who caught a deep pass against South Carolina to give a little bit of a spark. Uh, 5'9", he, 5'9", wide receiver, about 190. He is also... Uh, he, uh, he's also he runs like a 10-2 in the 100, so he's really fast. So I anticipate we'll try to launch some passes deep, get in there, quick three-step drop, boom, and just throw it in the air and let the wide receivers run underneath it. I do sense we'll see more of that in this game because Jackson Arnold has appeared to get more comfortable with doing that. So with Brendan Thompson, J.J. Hester, this year ones, and then you've got uh, Jacob Jordan, the true freshman. He's a uh, walk-on, and he does a really good job of finding small pockets to get himself open to where the defense isn't too much around him. So Jackson Arnold can kind of dump it to him. And then you got one last person, true freshman, uh, Zion Kearney. He's a bigger receiver at 6'1", 200 pounds. He's one that I'm hoping we see a lot more of. He's got nice size, and he has the capabilities of being a number one. We just got to get to that point of him playing like that. And I think if he plays over the next few weeks, in which I hope he does, he'll have the opportunity to, to cement himself as a 
true threat going into next season? On the Ole Miss side of the ball, I mean, obviously, Jackson Dart, everybody knows of about course. that, and, and everybody knows about Trey Harris, and that's going to be the focal point of the offense. But I think the major thing to watch for is how Ole Miss distributes their running back carries. Ulysses mm-hmm. Bentley ran for over 100 yards against LSU. Henry Parrish had two weeks to get healthy. He was kind of beat up in the game as well, so the running game could look significantly different. And the question that Ole Miss fans are looking for is the usage in the middle of the field with Caden Priestcorn and Daquan Wright and even moving potentially Juice Wells into the slot or Caden Lee, if that would happen, it could potentially open up that offense. And listen, Oklahoma has a legit defense. They're second in the country in sacks or something like that with 27. Mm -hmm. And Danny Stutzman's a really good player in the middle, and I think Billy Bowman is on the back end of the defense. Him and and Jackson Dart know each other very well. I got to interview Dart at SEC Media Days, and they were going back and forth picking at each other, and I asked Dart if he was ready for him. He's like, oh, yeah, you know, we like to banter each other. So I'm pretty excited to see that matchup. Yeah, and and they probably know each other because Jackson Dart visited Oklahoma. It was Oklahoma and Ole Miss for his transfer um, period. So they probably actually, you know, who knows? Billy Bowman might have showed him around Norman. Who knows? But (laughs) Fair point. Yeah. Those are really big players offensively, but I think the defensive line against Oklahoma's offensive line are going to be the story of this game. So if you want to look at it, if you look at it, Ole Miss, I think they're 20 and a half point favorites at the moment, which is Mm -hmm. absolutely unreal that Ole Miss is a 20 and a half point favorite over Oklahoma, even thinking about what we were coming into the season as. And the over-under is only like at 48.5. So they think the game is a 35 to 14, 34 to 14 type ball game. I genuinely think that if Ole Miss's defense plays the way that they can play, especially that front seven, which is mm-hmm. really, really good, I don't see how Oklahoma scores seven t- or fourteen points in that situation. Um, I'm because- in, we're all in the same boat. Everybody yeah. in Oklahoma thinks the exact same thing. We're curious to see if this team can actually score points right now. We've just not done a very good job of it over the last two weeks. We've scored what twelve points in the last two games combined um, since the Auburn win on the road, it's it's just not been good. And so with that defensive front, yes, I'm concerned. I think South Carolina has one of the best defensive fronts in college football, especially at the edge. You know, we, people, I think people really sleep on how good they are defensively oh, really, just because really of some good. of the offensive woes that they have a tendency of having. For us, the big thing is going to be, not only double teaming some of the double teaming those, those big uh, defensive linemen you all have, but getting rid of the ball quickly. If we can get rid of the ball quickly, I think we have a chance of putting up points. The question is, can we get rid of the ball quickly? And until we actually see it in action, nobody's going to believe it. Can we? I mean, we were able to do some stuff on Auburn at some point, but the question is going to be just how dedicated will Ole Miss be from not only the opening snap but through the fourth quarter of trying to demolish the offensive line. If they're trying to demolish the offensive line the entire time, the motivation is there and you start to go into your three deep of being able to push because we're getting later in the season. So, you know, you know, fatigue factor does kick in for everybody. If the dedication is there, it's going to be a tough day. But with the new play caller, new scheme mindset, more so leveraging plays that you know that your strengths are at, Oklahoma has a chance to put up some points, but they've, they've got to show us before anybody's truly going to believe it. Yeah, and Ole Miss through seven games, they've given up one rushing touchdown this season. Woo. And that was on a play that the the ball carrier fumbled. It went into the end zone, and it was recovered. Oh, gosh. That, that yeah, sounds so, familiar. Yeah, it's one of those type deals. That's how Ole Miss ended up losing the Kentucky game, by the way. Fair point. So – this is a really, really interesting game. The storyline, the stuff happened on the front seven against Oklahoma's offensive line. What what do you think is the most important thing for Oklahoma? What is what is the most important storyline for Oklahoma going into this game? The biggest one, and, and again, it's definitely going to be the offense. Can the offense keep the ball and move the ball? We have the talent there, as we talked about before. If you look at the blue chip ratio, we have the talent there. Mm -hmm. It's just on the offense, it's all young. Replacing your entire offensive line, we was hoping that at some point they could jail. But it's hard to jail whenever you've gone through four centers over a three-game span to start the season because 
of health. You were dealing with a lot of injuries. Then you lose one of your transfer offensive linemen, Gary and Hatchet. He had shoulder surgery. And that's the beginning of the season. And so now you've got guys slowly coming back and they're starting to get a little bit more healthy. But hopefully we'll start seeing some of our younger players play also. We've got a few uh, four-star players that are itching to get on the field. If we can get them out there, because I think they've got enough strength to try to cause problems for the defensive line, stopping the defensive line is not going to be that easy because you all have, like I said, a very good one. I give those props. But if we can get our guy, young guys in there that are ready to really start hitting people and they're willing to, we could probably slow down some things just enough to get certain plays off. Running the ball has been a problem. So the offensive storyline is every storyline for this team is literally what is the offense going to do? If the offense can try to move the ball, I think we'd be fine. I think for Ole Miss, the big thing is going to be for you all is just trying to shut Oklahoma out. If you can get a zero on there, day is just you know a very easy walk in the park. Yep. Potentially, I, th- I think Ole Miss has a good chance to do this. I think Oklahoma is going to score in this game. I don't think Ole Miss is going to get a zero on this game. And that is because I think <clears throat> that Ole Miss has the uh, propensity to bust. And Makes sense. There's a problem with – like the Kentucky game was the problem with drive-saving penalties. One mm-hmm. of the touchdown drives for Kentucky had four pass interference penalties that happened on third down. You know, it, it, was, it was a disaster, and anything that could go wrong did go wrong. Mm-hmm. So we'll see exactly how that goes. Anyway, thanks for watching the podcast on um, Locked On Ole Miss, Locked On Sooners. When we come back, we will talk about paths to victory for both teams and give our score predictions. Stick around. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Right now, new customers bet $5 and get $200 back in bonus bets uh, over at FanDuel. Right now, Oklahoma, 20 and a half point underdog. According to FanDuel, uh, I'm thinking the defense is going to have a chance to keep this close if the offense is somewhat functional in this game. If they can, that's going to be a huge boon for the Sooners. Take the under. Listen, Ole Miss can score. They've got a great offense, but they've put up big numbers against teams that don't have a pulse. So I expect the defense to be able to keep this one close. Go do that over at FanDuel.com, America's number one sports book. All right, we are back in Thunderdome. Stephen Willis from Locked On Ole Miss, Jay Smith from Locked On Sooners. We are talking about the second ever meeting between the Oklahoma Sooners and the Ole Miss Rebels. And Jay, I do want to apologize to all Oklahoma fans because there is no reason this should be an 11 o'clock kickoff. They are not going to get the full disclosure of what the Grove is and what Ole Miss is. They're going to walk away and say, hey, that was great, but and I was kind of disappointed. It's like, yeah, it was 11 a.m. If you guys had a 2.30 kickoff or even a 6.30 kickoff, that place would be completely different. But I think you should – your fans should enjoy it. Just know that if you can't get into the stadium, go down to the square. That's a good place to watch what's going on. And there's hmm. several restaurants in and around the square where people can eat. So that's what you should look at as well. Okay, I'm going to be in town. I actually fly into Memphis on Thursday night, so I'll be out there in the Oxford area walking around, checking out what the Grove looks like and everything. I I, I agree with you. Ajax Diner. Okay, Ajax Diner. Noted. Mm -hmm. Written it down. But I agree with you. 11 o'clock kickoff is just so unfortunate. I was hoping that it would have been, you know, the – the the two thirty you know three thirty Eastern two thirty Central or even later, I I kind of wonder if they'd be willing to trade the game and move it to Norman instead so that we can really experience what Oxford looks like next season when we expect people to actually be healthy and ready to play. But no, it's gonna be it's gonna be fun to get out there and see another large stadium in the SEC. The Auburn environment was great. Um, I don't think there's any type of hexes or voodoo going on at at, at Oxford, is there? No, no it's just okay. an old stadium. The stadium was built in like 1911. Um, Sweet. Yeah. Like old stadiums. It, yeah. So the sidelines, especially the side stanchions, that's the old part. The south end zone is the, the house that Eli built. So that's what that expansion was. And okay. the one at the north end zone where the big video board is going to be is where they sit the students. And that was built like six, seven years ago. Okay, good. So we'll be able to see some old and new all combined. Mm-hmm. So on that, as Oklahoma comes in here, there's there's really one path to victory in this game. Turnovers. 
we, we need to force as many turnovers as possible and minimize ours. Like I said, this defense has been very opportunistic. We, we've done well in causing turnovers, and we do really good at not allowing too many big plays, except for when we get too aggressive, then we will, we're susceptible to them because we have an aggression problem sometimes. But usually that aggression has helped us to actually, that's why we got 25 sacks this season. We're you know third in the country in that. We, we do a good job of getting the pressure and forcing the quarterback to throw passes they don't want to or throw passes that get tipped. Our, for us, it's if we can win the turnover battle, we have a good chance of keeping the score very, very low. Now, we, have, we can do big plays. Like I said, we've got very fast wide receivers. We just got to stop you all from doing your big plays, get pressure, get those three and outs on a regular basis, and then hopefully try to get one or two big plays out of our guys, either a big run or some big catches that can help us to get, you know, in field goal range or, you know, get a score or two. I, I, my, I hope this score is lower than the score you guys had against Kentucky. That would probably help us a lot. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, if the three turnovers against South Carolina happened, like I said, it was 14-9. to nine. It was mm-hmm. right in the wheel wheelhouse of what Oklahoma would have been looking for, but that game was ended because of what happened. Ole Miss's path to victory is getting the offense back on track. The mm-hmm. offense hasn't looked right the th- first three games of the SEC. This is Lane Kiffin coming off of a bye week. This is Lane Kiffin going to respect the defense that he's going against. I think you're going to see something similar to what Ole Miss put on the field against Penn State. I think you're going to see our Texas A&M or even LSU a year ago because he respected those defense and their ability to get to the quarterback. He respects the Oklahoma defense, and that means the offense is going to be completely unlocked. You're going to see Caden Priestcorn get used in the middle of the field. You're going to see Juice yeah. Wells do, you doing things differently than just running 40-yard go routes. All of that's going to happen. They're going to figure out a way to creatively do that. And when you add a running game that should be starting to round into form a little bit with the addition of Bentley and Parrish, I think this offense is going to be tough to deal with. And as good as Oklahoma's defense is, if Ole Miss doesn't turn over the ball, Ole Miss's defense is good enough to where they can prevent Oklahoma from doing that same thing. So like you said, 17 points, the game might be over. I think Brent Venables really wants to muck up the proceedings. He wants this to get very slow. The tendency for Joe John Finley is the same thing, running tempo on offense. They can't do that. I expect, Oklahoma to play very slow. They're very going, very much going to be Vandy this weekend. Uh, and yeah, if that happens, they have a shot. But if if Oklahoma, if you come out and you see Oklahoma running tempo, just go ahead and mark off. Ole Miss is going to cover. Yeah, and if if, there's a, if if that happens, it's over. It's a, it's a done deal. And I'm hoping that we don't run into any type of uh, we don't we don't do a bunch of tempo. Uh, I do sense we will have some going because like you said, that is part of the playbook and a part of the philosophy they have, it's part but of only you, you probably culture, only, really. right, right. It's part of the culture. Yeah. Really. It truly is. It's been embedded in that since Levy came, you know, two years ago when Brent Venables took the job, uh, initially Kevin, in 2022. Kevin Wilson basically brought that into the Oklahoma system 20 years ago. He did. He did. That was, that was one of his yeah. big things. And it's funny, even. Thinking about that, Kevin Wilson now coach at Tulsa. When we played Tulsa last, that was the conversations was about how him and Brent Venables used to battle it out uh, with those two different offenses and those tempos and how Brent Venables, you know, they, their focus was to stop it as much as possible. And we all know that Lane Kiffin has an offense that is known for really bending defenses. It And as you said, the, the offense has kind of struggled going into the SEC. And so for Oklahoma, they, we've got to hope that that continues for you all getting it back on track is really going to be a saving grace. But if we can slow that down, because Jackson Dart's been one of the top quarterbacks in the country right now, especially statistically, Trey Harris is everything. How is he health wise? I know that that has been a question over the last couple of weeks. A, nobody's going to know until warm ups on Saturday, but the, right. rumor, the rumor is um, that he's probably going to try and give it a go. Okay. So for us, it's going to be all about uh, slowing that down, not allowing yeah. that. And the Caleb, last time, by the way, Caleb Cunningham is going to be on campus, a, a big five-star visitor. Um, oh, I know Caleb Cunningham. Yeah, uh, that's and, and, awesome. And, and, and usually, when that happens, Lane Kiffin likes to throw the ball deep to Trey Harris. I can see that because yeah. that's you got you got to show the guy what's the possibility because he's right always now committed to recruiting. Alabama. Yes, always A B R. Always mm. be recruiting or always be close, and we can do both of them. But yes, that makes sense. So for us, it's preparation for deep passes, a lot of shots, 
as long as we can keep the blitzes going and get the hits, hopefully slow some of that down. All right, so what do you got for a score prediction? Uh, being completely transparent, I'm seeing a 20-7 to seven game. I think Ole Miss wins that one. I'm going to go with 34 to 10. And like I said, it's not denigrating anything program related for all your fans that might be watching. Cause I, whenever Same. Ole Miss goes to the pl- palace on the plains next year, and we know that it could be a completely different story, but this year it just doesn't match up. But um, thank you very much, Jay, for joining me. This was a whole bunch of fun. What have you got going on um, this weekend, man? Um, I'll be there in Oxford enjoying the festivities and getting to see another SEC stadium, which is exciting. So we're, we're, we're happy to be here and we're excited to, you know, rebound ourselves hopefully over the next few weeks to where, you know, when next season starts, people start to get, we get back to old Oklahoma of old. All right. Well, take care, bud. And, um, safe travels to Oxford, man. Thanks a bunch. Appreciate you having me.